Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I think it's really an exciting opportunity to speak with, in front of you at this Development Impact Bond Conference where, as a global fund, we looked at this um, mechanism, an innovative financing mechanism, <laughs> in order to uh, mobilize resources, additional resources for malaria. We thought that it was a, it was a, it, a DIB operates in an intersection um, at a, an intersection of three sort of key trends. One is the funder's increased interest in results-based financing. Another is the service providers that are looking for more autonomy and flexibility in the way they implement the programs. And the third was the private investors that were looking for investment opportunities that had a blended return of both a measurable social impact as well as a financial return. So um, this morning, I'd just like to talk about how, as the Global Fund, we looked at the development impact bond for malaria for about 18 months, and what were the challenges and the complexity and the issues that we saw if we looked at ourselves as an outcome funder and share with you uh, some of these learnings. So um, could I just ask you, ask you um, do, does, how much of you, of you know about the Global Fund? Could you raise your hands? Oh, great. So as you know, we're a 21st century uh, financial institution that was designed and established to accelerate the end of AIDS, TB, and malaria. We raise and invest nearly $4 billion a year to support programs by local experts in 140 countries. 95% of our money comes from donor governments, and 5% comes from private sector and foundations. And one of the aim is to increase the, uh, the resources we mobilize from the private sector and foundations. We are an international organization, and our core business is grant making. We don't finance in, in terms of uh, forms of uh, equity or debt. And this is our market share. Um, as you can see, we fund 20% of international funding for AIDS, 75% of TB, and 67% of mal malaria. So you can see we're the largest um, funder for malaria in the globe. And there has been a significant in, um, achievements over the past decade since the establishment of the Global Fund, as well as the United States Pol um, Presidential Malaria Initiative, that are basically the two key funders for malaria. But there are still a lot of gap, and there's still 630,000 people who die of malaria, and 90% of that is coming in the sub-Saharan African countries. And the gains are still very, very fragile, and malaria is something that's preventable as well as curable. That's the big difference compared to the other diseases. So innovation is, is part of our DNA. Uh, we are a PPP. It was one of the, the new PPPs that was formed in the early 20th, uh, 21st century. And it's part of our DNA. So we look at new solutions and partnership in order to raise money and also deliver the inter um, intervention programs more effectively. And that's the reason why we were very interested in a development impact bond structure. We saw it for a couple of, um, we saw a couple of benefits to it. One was to uh, unlock the, the private uh, capital, which we never have been able to tap into and that would accelerate the proven intervention programs in the countries that are at need. Another is mobilized resources. As you can see, I won't go into the structure because I, I know that you all know what the basic structure is, but the key difference between a social impact bond and the development impact bond is basically, I think, the outcome funders. For a SIB, it's the domestic governments, for a DIP, it's an external institution. The way we saw it was the outcome funder would be a consortium of variety of um, institutions. 
which would include the Global Fund and other global health partners, as well as private sector companies. Um, we looked at possibly mining companies that have operation in sub-Saharan Africa, where you know typically their operation is at in the rural areas, where they they face um, their employees are facing malaria as a huge health risk, and they there is it also um, affecting their bottom line. You know, they, there's a lot of absentees, there's uh, increased health cost, and there's low productivity. So there has been a benefit and cost-benefit analysis for mining companies in terms of investing in malaria programs. Another would be uh, bilateral and multilateral agencies that are looking at results-based financing as a more uh, effective way of development aid. And we also saw the recipient government to be an outcome funder. Even if their portion would be very small, we wanted to make sure that they had their skin in the game. And, and because malaria is a public health issue, the government had to be involved in, in this whole scheme. So by, by using this mechanism, we thought that by focusing rigorously on the outcomes and impact, will be able to drive more efficiency in the delivery of implementation, as well as uh, generate greater value for money. So we um, internally extensively had a lot of discussions with our malaria experts and our monitoring and evaluation specialists. And we also went to our malaria disease committee, which consists of um, external malaria specialists, to, find, to figure out how can a DIB be applied in malaria intervention program. Because as we all know, the indicator is what triggers the, pro the program, uh, the, the payment back to the investor. But the program had to be related to the, the um, indicator. So with that, you know, we were looking at, do we just do a prevention <laughs> program, which we know it's proven, distributing bed nets and doing indoor residual spraying. But what would be the indicator for that? Or do we do a holistic, integrated malaria intervention program, which includes the prevention, but also the diagnostic and treatment, which are also very much proven in the malaria space. And we also have a very reliable, low-cost, rapid disease um, testing that, that is now available. So that could also further be expanded um, to be used. And the conclusion was it should be an uh, integrated malaria intervention program. And with that, the, the indicator had to be sensitive enough to show the progress of this integrated malaria intervention program. And that led us to conclude to the parasite prevalence to become to be the impact indicator for as a baseline for, for this uh, dip. Parasite prevalence indicator is captured. Um, it's measured through a population-based survey, so it's you don't have to rely on the uh, the information system in the health facility, which tends to be quite weak in the sub-Saharan African region. So we wanted to use the parasite uh, parasite indicator as the baseline, but also capture some of the outcome indicators, such as uh, how much percentage of the children slept under the bed nets the previous night, how much percent of the households were sprayed with this IRS in the past year, but also capture some of the data um, through centennial sites in health facilities. Because one of the key things about malaria is that even if you, you, you do 100% of what needs to be done in terms of integration, uh, the integra um, integrated malaria program, a climate a, a heavy rainy season could immediately change the, the effect, effectiveness of the program. So these are the four criteria that we saw in successfully launching a development impact bond. And given that it, the DIB has never been tested, we really wanted to just do a pilot in a limited geographic area in one country. One was, as I mentioned, because the Global Fund is, is a, a largest malaria funder in the world, it really didn't make sense for us, to, for us to just be the sole outcome funder. We had to get the private sector companies on board as outcome funders. 
that would be additional new money for malaria programs, and it will allow us to accelerate the intervention program and make basically decrease the number of people uh, suffering from malaria. Another is driving operational efficiency, and this was giving more flexibility and autonomy to the implementers. Um, as you can imagine, you know, our core business is, uh, is grant making, and we really are very rigorously um, looking after our grantees in terms of the programmatic and financial results that they deliver. We measure them against the budget that they, they first put together. So they're quite tied up, and it's sometimes a little bit too tied up that they don't have the flexibility of changing, adapting to whatever is happening on the ground. And we felt that because of this, we'll give them much more flexibility to the implementer. But we also saw that possibly some incentive schemes, possibly some in financial incentive schemes in, in the form of bonus or penalty, in risk sharing or profit sharing schemes, as well as non-monetary um, incentive schemes, like putting a, um, a star in front of uh, the desk of a healthcare worker, these are sometimes a, an enormous um, motivating effect to healthcare workers. So we were looking at these financial, uh, financial as well as non-financial incentives to further drive uh, the efficiency of delivering the implementation uh, of the program. And then we also wanted to make sure that the health information system was being built through this program. So in the long run, the country has a strong health system uh, that could be used not just for malaria programs, but for, for any health programs. As we saw in the outbreak of the Ebola this summer, it's the health system that, that's really the, the core platform for enabling these developing countries to make sure that they're able to deliver the healthcare pro, um, services to, the, to their population. And then, of course, designing and structuring the, uh, the mechanism with the, um, the risk-adjusted return that would be in line for the investors as well as from the Global Fund's perspective. So, um, as I mentioned, we really were not planning to do a, a nationwide uh, malaria intervention program funded by a, by a dip, but rather do a pilot in a defined geographic area. And through that, um, learn through it and then hopefully scale up to a nationwide uh, program. So we worked very closely with our country teams and financial and legal and risk colleagues to figure out how can, can we really do this and, and how can we identify a country that could, could, um, could raise their hands to partner with us to launching this. But we faced quite a lot of challenges. And just to, to sort of remind you, there's two contexts, one is you know, in, in these countries where we were looking at a sub-Saharan African region, you have the Ministry of Health, you have the Global Fund uh, grantee, you have other health funders, uh, implementers, all carrying out intervention programs in different parts of the country. And then also the Global Fund this spring had launched a new way of uh, the way we, we make grants. Previously, we used to do a round-based uh, system. So basically, we called out for proposals every year, and countries would submit their grant proposals, and we assessed it. Now, we've launched a, a new funding model that's an allocation-based model. So we're now going, we just launched this, this three-year allocation uh, funding model. So the countries were all given what their country allocation is early this year. And based upon their needs and where they are with their national disease strategy, they are able to submit their grant proposal any time during the period of 2014 and 16. And with that makes a, a bit of a complication. Because the Global Fund, as an outcome funder, if the program is successful, the amount that the Global Fund would be paying back to the investor had to come from the country's allocation, 
we don't have like a special bucket for special projects like this to, to test uh, different innovative schemes. So we had to work with the country team when once we identified a country and to see whether the country would be willing to take a piece of their allocation for this project, which has never been tested. That's a significant challenge just in terms of how the Global Fund's operation is. So while we were looking at this, a lot of challenges, complications, issues were raised. One is equity. If you're doing a ring-fenced pilot, the population in that area would be benefiting from the program of, of a dip funded program. But what happens to the other population of the, the country? There's a, a, an equity issue. Another is, as I mentioned, we were thinking about financial and non-financial incentives. What happens after the dip is over after three years? Wouldn't would these incentives still be in place? Most likely not. So wouldn't their incentives be distorted by this? Another is country ownership. Because we were looking at this, this whole scheme at the secretariat level, when do we involve the country? I have had the opportunity to talk to the permanent secretary of Mozambique and talk about this scheme, and he was very eager. But also we had to involve our country coordinating mechanism, which is an entity that puts together the, the grant proposal to the Global Fund, and that's not just the Ministry of Health, but it's also uh, other donor, uh, donors in the country, as well as civil society and people affected by the community. And we have to make, them an, make it an exclusive country ownership. And of course, the sustainability question always came up. What happens after three years? Even if it's successful, who's gonna take over? Ideally, it would be the government, but even if that is the case, the rate of return that the government would be, if the government ends up being the sole outcome funder and eventually the DIB becomes a SIP, the, they still have to pay a certain return to the investor if the program is successful. That return probably has to be less than if the government went to the capital market to raise money. So, does that, is, would that be a feasible sort of rate? That's another question. And then, as I mentioned, with the new funding model uh, that was launched, there was issue about the country allocation. Would the country be willing to take part of their allocation to, to put this aside for, for a dip, as well as the timing of the country proposal? Many of these proposals were coming in this year and probably early next year. So if the grant is already up and running, it requires some reprogramming in order to launch this because the Global Fund is, is an outcome funder. And then that means we also have to go through this rigorous uh, technical review panel um, assessment, which if we were able to get some investors and even private sector companies as outcome funders, we're still at a risk that our technical review panel, which is an independent uh, entity, may reject the program. So there's just so many processes that we, we faced um, challenges that, that made it very, very difficult for us. And then when we were talking with some of the private banks, other issues came up. What about governance? The investors have their money at risk, so of course they want to, to make sure that the money is spent and, and the program is success, successful so that both social impact and the financial return would be coming back to them. But they also want to leverage the Global Fund's sort of core expertise of oversight of, of program implementation. But there's a bit of a conflict of interest because the Global Fund is an outcome funder of course, we wouldn't have that perverse sort of incentive to not make the program uh, not successful, but that was another tricky thing. How does the governance structure uh, work in this kind of a case? And then, of course, the risk-adjusted return. As I mentioned, the Global Fund is funded 95% by public uh, donor governments. So the cost of capital analysis was conducted um, internally with the discussion with Treasury. And it was quite difficult to figure out, okay, is there a way that is we were able to, 
to structure this in a way that is in line with private in investors' expectation as well. Of course, we looked at layering the, the investors as well as partial guarantees, but then in some ways, we, we were coming close to perhaps this is not really an impact investment opportunity, but rather more of a philanthropic investment opportunity. And that, that's another sort of challenge that we faced. Oops. Sorry. So, so with that, um, uh, I think uh, we, we have concluded that these were really multiple challenges that we really could not sort of find a viable solution at this point when we're launching this new funding model. So we decided to pause with this project. I think one of the key things for us in, in this learning, um, we've, we've spoke with many of you guys uh, here at this conference while we were developing this, uh, this um, project, was I think a DIB and a SIB is quite effective and it works when it's in a closed environment. You know, you, you've seen the success of the Peterborough prison system. You're in a confined space. We'll hear about the UBS Optum Foundation's uh, education dip. It's also in a school with a relatively small number of girls. But with health, with malaria, it's very, very difficult. You have multiple implementers in the country. Um, we know infectious disease has no boundaries, so you cannot ring fence anything. And in order to, to use a measurable uh, indicator, even if you know, we know parasite prevalence, we, it's a reliable data, it's still quite difficult in order to, to make that attribution. And, um, but we, we do hope that in, in the long run, with some of the learnings that everyone will be doing, we'll be able to sort of figure out some ways to, to participate in this space. But for now, I think we just really wanted to sort of share the experience because we have worked on this quite a bit and we look forward to, to continuing on the dialogue um, in this space as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Mikiko. Um, really, uh Fascinating in-depth insight into a potential outcome funder, um, certainly one with uh, even more stakeholders than normal outcome funding groups might have. But it, it was very interesting to see, and I think this will be common to all outcome funders, the, the, um, the, the interest in this model in unlocking private uh, capital, which of course up to this point is, is one of the uh, complexities and challenges. And of course what this means in terms of efficiency and uh, enhancing value for money and the addi uh, additionality question. Um, so thank you very much for that and I'd like to ask for questions from the floor now. Please. Uh, good morning everybody. Uh, I'm Kamala Shaldar from Innovision Global. Actually I have a small question. As we saw that uh, in the SIB and DIB model there are uh, investors, there are uh, outcome funders, there are donors and there are also the implementers. So uh, my question is, who were the initiators of this sort of funding and uh, who is the owner basically of this sort of projects? Well, I think depending on the project, uh, it can be initiated by, by uh, a, a nonprofit organization like social finance. It could be started by, by a bilateral like DFID. It could be started by a multilateral like the Global Fund. Um, the ownership, I think, is, is where, who participates in the governance part. That's the key thing. And uh, from the Global Fund's perspective, we really wanted to, we saw this mechanism is really, as, as one of a results-based financing model, basically, it's to drive development aid efficiency. And, and it was a, there was a wrapper that was basically involving the pr private investors who would give the, uh, you know, provide the capital upfront. But we really wanted to sort of use this as an innovative mechanism to work with the partners, um, both the investors, the implementers, other donors, to see what really works because it's this untested mechanism and that was the key thing also for us. 
we love to innovate. We love to to make sh to to drive the efficiency of program implementation. So um, it's not something that we just wanted to do ourselves, but we really wanted to share with the partners who would be interested in doing this to see what the learning experience is. Thanks, Kamash. I, I think you've actually put your um, finger on a, on a really important variable here, which which goes then into uh, you know not just the design, but of course the, the contracting modalities, the procurement opportunities involved, which I'm, I'm sure will be touched upon many times during the course of the day. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rita Prakas from the Center for Global Development. I just had uh, one question. When you were on this slide that listed all the, the challenges that, that you came across, which was really uh, very helpful, thank you for that. Um, one of the things that you mentioned is the idea that the, the, f the funding coming from the country when this dib became a SIB would be a problem. So I just wondered why that logic kind of, where that came from, that the dib would turn into a SIB. Why would that be the case? Wouldn't the next step potentially be the government maybe funding the intervention directly if it works, um, potentially with the support of the Global Fund, or maybe kind of a results-based funding model where you take the investor out of the equation and the Global Fund funds the government for sustaining the gains, um, or, or something like that. Why would it become a SIB, and isn't it kind of a question about um, coming up with a sustainable model and sustained funding for disease control, which is a problem that I think you probably grapple with all the time. Like, Why is it unique to the development impact bond? No, um, I think I may have sort of jumped from quickly from a div, a three-year div, to becoming a sieve where it's it would be the recipient government that would be an outcome funder. I it's, I, I don't believe that would always be the case. Um, I just sort of jumped into sort of one extreme to another. Um, it could be that perhaps private sector companies saw, you know, they're putting a lot of money into malaria intervention programs in the countries that they operate in Sub-Saharan Africa. So they may see this as a interesting sort of scheme where if the program is, is successful and is able to achieve measurable impact, then they pay back to investors, but the, the investor would be incurring the implementation risks. So that might be something that they may continue to be interested in, in being part of. So, you know, there might be a, a gra you know, gradual sort of transformation as well. Um, I just sort of jumped into an extreme case just to point out that if the government ends up becoming the sole outcome funder, then it really becomes a question of then is the return, you know, something that they're willing to pay compared to what they go out to the market with their, say, a bond, a regular bond. I mean, I, I had a small question myself. Um, just in, in terms, you, you noted that uh, a couple of the concerns in, in uh, relation to the Mozambique malaria one related to equity, distortion, uh, country ownership and sustainability. Why would they be necessarily different under a DIB than they would under the traditional grant mechanisms? Um, well, for instance, with uh, equity, as I mentioned, because we were, I think, it's more because we were thinking of doing a development impact bond in a limited geographic area. If we were to pilot this in a, a, na a national-wide uh, program, then the equity issue would not come up. But in terms of incentives, um, with the Global Fund's current grant making, we don't have any of those financial incentives in terms of reward or penalty. And that's not most likely something that we would be willing to do as part of our grant making. So that's the sort of difference that, that would be a difference between a ring fence dip and our traditional grant making. Hi, Julia here from Lion's Head. Um, it just struck me that as I was listening to your comments about um, ring fencing and these projects is that when you think of a development impact bond for a disease like malaria, it very much overlaps with randomized control trials that governments like DFID will fund in terms of research support for academics exploring this space. And in that case, you are ring fencing a small area because you're putting into um, proof of concept between villages, for example, if you do this one vector control intervention, will it decrease disease? And, and the bar there is even higher than the outcome measure which you've chosen, which is 
the level of parasite prevalence. In those randomized control trials, the risk is even higher because you're measuring disease or epidemiological outcomes of the in individual patient. Because you've chosen a lower bar of the hurdle rate to hit, it seems um, very complementary to what <coughs> funders fund in terms of research. So there could be an overlap in terms of aggregating some of those outcome funders for a project like this. And in the case of successful vector control, once a randomized control trial has been done, for example, like in the bed nets example, the countries themselves can then make applications to the global fund for further funding of this intervention. So even if you put in a dip where there's a rim-fenced population to prove that it works, the eventual outcome, if it turns into a SIB, is that the government can then write an application to further rounds of global fund funding to say, we would like to scale this up nationally. Yeah. Have you thought about how we can possibly um, pair some of the funding with proof of outcomes in regular ongoing research? Well, one part of our new funding model is, as, as I mentioned, we informed all the countries their country allocation for this three-year period. Um, that's called the indicative funding. But we also have a little pot of money called the incentive funding, which is uh, aimed to uh, sort of motivate the countries to be ambitious with something like that. You know, if they, are if they have some evidence that shows that this is something clearly has an impact um, and has better efficiency, they could put the, the country could actually put that in their grant proposal and that would be, they would be able to tap into this incentive funding. But as I mentioned, it's, it's all sort of based upon country ownership. Um, you know, aid has always, has traditionally somewhat been more driven by the donors, but the Global Fund is, was established as one of the principles of country ownership. So we don't dictate the countries what they need to do. They need to, to develop their own national disease strategy and plan and accordingly submit a grant proposal. And that's how we assess whether technically, whether that's feasible or not. So, you know, if the country is, is you know, brings that up, we'll definitely review it, but it's not for the Global Fund. We're not in the position to sort of tell them, you know, that's how they should be doing. But we hope that there would be some ambitious, innovative uh, ideas that they would come up with in their upcoming grant proposals. Thank you very much, Makiko. Did I see uh, one last hand? David. I just, um, Matiko's point on governance, which I think is a really important point. There are three ways in which governance, I think, operates here. One is clearly the formal relationship with the capital funders. The second is through the outcome contract, where there's some quite important controls can be embedded. But I think it is right to flag that there is potentially a conflict between being the outcome funder and sitting on top of the board. Uh, and third, and I don't think you should underestimate the value of this, is transparency. Um, you know, I think it's entirely right the outcome funder should be an observer at the board meetings. Um, I think it's entirely right that local constituencies are regularly updated on what is going on. And I think that transparency, at least in my experience, is incredibly powerful in terms of guiding the right behavior. Thank you very much, Makiko.